Praise the Lord. Well, good evening. And uh, it's good that Janet's back home from hospital now, isn't it? Praise the Lord. And um, praise God. Don't forget our meetings on Sunday, 10.30 in the morning. We're continuing our Impact series this Sunday morning. And then Alan Jones is ministering to us on Sunday evening. And we're looking forward to that as well. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, after the Easter break, we finally resuming our series in Growing Godly, Part 17. And um, if you remember briefly, you probably may not remember a lot of it, but I'm sure you remember some of it. But we have um, dealt with two weeks on the priesthood. And um, in those talks, particularly the last one, I did a brief talk on some of the garments that the priests wore. But there are things I can add to some of those. Um, and so um, that's where we are tonight. And, um, and then by probably early May, we shall finish the series when we talk about when the tabernacle is finished. So tonight, we're going to turn back to Exodus 28. And um, the title of tonight's message is The Ephod and Breastplate Stones. The Ephod and Breastplate Stones. Exodus chapter 28. And we're going to read um, quite a lengthy passage from verse 6 down to verse 21. And they shall make the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen artistically worked. It shall have two shoulder straps joined at its two edges, and so it shall be joined together. And the intricately woven band of the ephod, which is on it, shall be of the same workmanship, made of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six names on the other stone in order of their birth. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall set them in settings of gold. And you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders as a memorial. You shall also make settings of gold. And you shall take, make two chains of pure gold like braided cords and fasten the braided chains to the setting. You shall make the breastplate of judgment, artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen you shall make it. It shall be doubled into a square. A span shall be its length, and a span shall be its width. And you shall put settings of stones in it, four rolls of stones, the first roll shall be a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald. This shall be the first roll. The second roll shall be turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third roll, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth roll, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold settings. And the stone shall have the names of the sons of Israel, twelve according to their names like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the twelve tribes. You shall make chains for the breastplate at the end, like braided cords of pure gold, and you shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate and put the two rings on the end of the breastplate. We'll read, leave the reading there. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we have of delving into your word. I pray that, Lord, you will bless it to us tonight. 
In Jesus' precious name, amen. Now, as I said, I commented briefly on some of the garments um, in the last talk and also in the first talk when we were dealing with the priesthood. So I'm not going to go into all the blue, the purple, and the scarlet, red, and the fine twined linen tonight. But I want you to notice first that these garments were seven in number. In verse 4, you have six of them listed. These are the garments which you'll make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban, and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister to me as priest. But then if you look at verse 36 of the chapter, you will find the seventh. Because it says, you shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And you shall put it on a blue cord, that it may be on the turban, it shall be on the front of the turban. So there were seven actual items. And that plate of gold was attached to the mitre or the turban, as it's called in the New King James Version, uh, that we get from verse 4. So you've six pieces in verse 4 and the golden plate in verse 20, uh, 36. Now, seven pieces in all. And I suggest that there's great importance to that fact that there were seven pieces in the high priest garment. Because seven in Scripture is the number that's associated with perfection. And they remind us of the perfection that marks our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we noticed last time that by these garments, the high priest was consecrated. And it actually says in verse 3, you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans and why are filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. And so these garments marked him out as God's man, that he was set apart, set apart to do a holy work. And in this way, the people of Israel were taught that one day the Lord Jesus, the great high priest himself, would come in the fullness of time, and he will be uniquely holy, as we saw last time, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And Hebrews 7 tells us perfectly consecrated, set apart unto God. You see, these garments were for beauty and for glory. And if Hebrews chapter 7 and verse uh, 28, it says, For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Perfected forevermore as our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as I said, we're not dealing with all the garments because I briefly dealt with them last time. But there are some further details I wish to deal with. And two of those details take up more than half the chapter as I refer to the ephod and the breastplate. Now, with regard to wearing of these garments, the breastplate was the outermost garment. And then beneath that, the ephod, then beneath that, the robe, and so on. So the breastplate was the outermost garment. It was worn on the front of the priest, on the breast. And therefore, the breastplate and the ephod are to be viewed together. And one of the reasons for that is that they were actually joined together in an inseparable way. Look at verses 26 to 28. You shall make two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate 
on the edge of it, which is on the inner side of the ephod, and two other rings of gold you shall make, and put them on the two shoulder straps underneath the ephod towards its front, right at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod. And these two garments, these two pieces, were joined together by these golden rings and the chains of gold that actually linked them together. But there's another reason why the ephod and the breastplate are to be considered together, and that's because of certain stones that were attached to each piece. The ephod, as we've read, had two onyx stones on the shoulders, and the breastplate had 12 precious stones set into it. And when the high priest had these garments on, on the breastplate were 12 stones, and on his shoulders were the two onyx stones, and they were borne by him when he went in before the Lord. Now, these stones are of great meaning and great significance. So, first of all, tonight, let's look at the symbolism of the stones. They symbolize the Lord's people. And we know that so because engraved on these stones were the names of the tribes of Israel. Look at verse 9 and 10. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six names on the other stone in order of their birth. And then in verse 21, speaking of the breastplate, the stone shall have the names of the sons of Israel. This is on the breastplate. Twelve according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name, they shall be according to the twelve tribes. And so as regards symbolism, these stones represented the people of God. And scripture, you know, quite interestingly, burns, bears out that all of God's people are likened to stones. In fact, they're described that way in the word of God. If you turn to the first book of Peter and chapter 2 and verse 5, it tells us who are kept by, uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse 5, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And believers here are described as lively stones, living stones. And you'll notice from verse 4 of that same chapter, it says, coming to him, that's Christ as to a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. And so, friends, Christ is described in the same way. Now, in what sense is Christ a living stone? Well, he's a living stone in the sense that he died, but then he rose again. And having risen again, he became the foundation, the chief cornerstone of his church on which people are built. And Christ is the living stone. Now, you know, when you think of a stone, normally you think of something that's dead. You know, an ordinary stone off the car park or in the field, wherever you find it. It's an inanimate object. There's no life in it. And so it's striking to me that Christ, the Lord would refer to Christ in his word as a stone. But you see, he describes him as a living stone because, friends, he died and he rose again and he's the foundation on which everything else is built. He's the rock. He's indeed that impregnable and that unshakable basis in which his people stand. Because it's in Christ and on Christ the solid rock that the whole church is resting and therefore 
He's a living stone. He's alive. And to us, he's the foundation that will never, ever fail. Hallelujah. It will never crumble. It will never perish. And that's why the Bible calls him a living stone. Actually, if you turn to Psalm 118 and verse 22, you will see something else here. Psalm 118 and verse 22. Give you a minute to find it. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Friends, this is the Lord Jesus Christ. The builders refused him. In other words, Israel would not have him. But in spite of their opposition, in spite of their rejection, Still, he became the headstone of the corner. And the Bible says this is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. No wonder in that psalm he went on to say, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because everything in those words pertains to resurrection, the living stone. And friends, he is the source and the principle of life to all of his people. He transfuses life into his people so that they become spiritually alive, living stones. See, do you see the connection? The living stone, and we've been joined to him, joined to him, and we become living stones. So the Bible describes the believer as a stone, a living stone. Now, the unbeliever is an adamant stone. Ah, resisting the devil, re resisting the gospel, should I say. But we are living stones, changed, transformed by virtue of our union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Exodus 28, the stones represent God's people and they were joined to the high priest being part of his garments linked to him. And it's because we as God's people are linked to Christ that we are alive unto God. Folks, I don't know about you, but we've been quarried out of sin and joined to Christ and to God alive. And thank God today the church is growing across the nations. The church is being built as time goes by until it comes into its fullness. There's a very interesting scripture in Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35. Listen to these words as I read them to you. Daniel 2, 34. He said, You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, friends, that's a wonderful scripture because that stone is Christ. Hallelujah. And how it speaks of that stone becoming a great mountain and filling the whole earth. And friends, this is the Lord's great work that's in view here. Smashing the enemy. Praise God. The gospel progressing. The word of God filling the whole earth. What a savior. What a stone friends who smashes all the rest of the enemies and one day they will be smashed finally forever and forever and forever and Christ's glory will fill this earth. Thank God friends there's coming a day when the church will be complete and his people, the living stones built into him. So the symbolism of the stones of the people of God and their union with Christ. Secondly, tonight, I want us to look at the setting of the stones. 
because in both cases, the stones were set in gold. If you go back to Exodus 28, our main passage tonight, and the end there of the 11th verse, you shall set them in settings of gold. And then go to the stones on the breastplate in verse 20, at the end of the verse, they shall be set in gold settings. You know, friends, this shows you the skill that took place in the making of all this. So that those 12 precious stones and the two onyx stones Settings of golds were made and little insertions made on the breastplate of gold and they were all fitted exactly and held there. We also find that these gold settings were held together with chains of pure gold. Look at verse 13. You shall also make settings of gold and you shall make two chains of pure gold like braided cords and fasten the braided chains to the settings. And with regard to the breastplate, down to verse 22, you shall make chains for the breastplate at the end, like braided cords of pure gold. You shall make two rings of gold for the breastplate. Put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. Then you shall put the braided chains of gold in the two rings which are on the ends of the breastplate and the other two ends of the braided chains, you shall fasten to the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. Notice the intricacy of that work. Friends, I don't know about you, but when I was studying this, this was baffling my mind. To think of what was going on. Friends, this was no shoddy affair. This was the most intricate and detailed craftsmanship as these men made these chains so finely. The settings of the stones must have a spiritual meaning too. Gold in scripture is the metal that speaks of deity. It's the most precious of metals, isn't it? And therefore, it's the most durable of metals. Notice here, it's pure gold. You know, friends, there was no dross in it. And you know, friends, that reminds me that we are in union with Christ as stones, yes, but we're kept by the power of God. You know, friends, as the Lord's people, we are held and we are secured by the power of God. We're in the grip of the Almighty. Praise God tonight. He's got our, his hands upon us. We've been joined to Christ and joined to the Father, and we are held tonight by deity's infallible power. Look at some words of the Lord Jesus, just to confirm what I'm saying. In John's Gospel this time, chapter 10. John's Gospel, chapter 10, and verse 11. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But go to verse 28. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my Father's hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Friends, tonight we've got double security in his high priestly prayer. Jesus said, Father, keep through thine own name those that thou hast given thee. Friends, we're in the hand of Christ. We're in the hand of the Father. And just as those stones in Exodus 28 were set in the breastplate and on the shoulders, friends, we are joined to Christ and to the Father. Settings of gold, speaking of deity. Friends, I am so glad tonight that nobody can snatch us from the Father's hand. Hallelujah. 
So we've looked at the symbolism of the scones and the setting of the scones, but thirdly tonight, the significance of these stones. On these stones, as you know, the names of the tribes were engraved. Look at verses 9 and 10 again of Exodus 28. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave of them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on one stone and six names on the other stone in order of their birth. And verse 21, talking of the precious stones in the breastplate, the stone shall have the names of the sons of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engravings of a signet, each one with its own name, they shall be according to the 12 tribes. Now, this helps us to see the significance of the stones. Notice at the end of verse 10, it says, in order of their birth. And yet, in verse 21, it says, they shall be according to the 12 tribes. So, the same names are written on these stones. Two onyx stones on the shoulders set into the pouches of the ephod. Six names were written on each according to their birth. So that must have meant the names began with Reuben right through to Benjamin. But in the breastplate, notice they were written according to the tribes. And what that means is this, that there was a certain order in which the Lord's people in their tribes actually marched. And it wasn't the same order as their birth. We've not time to read it tonight, but if you really want to read into this, read Numbers chapter 2. Don't do it while I'm preaching, though. But read Numbers chapter 2 sometime, because you'll find that there was an order for marching in the wilderness. And when you compare Exodus 28 with Numbers chapter 2, you'll find also there that they marched in four rows with three tribes in each row. Just like the four rows of stones on the breastplate and three stones in each row. It was exactly the same layout. And you see, friends, there's a difference on how all the stones were lifted, listed. On the one hand, it was according to birth. On the other hand, it was according to the 12 tribes. And I point that out because when it says according to the 12 tribes, what it really means is this, that it was according to their work or to their roles in warfare. And the spiritual significance is this. When God's people are listed according to birth, I mean the new birth, when we got born again, there's no difference between us. And these two onyx stones were exactly the same stones with six tribes on each. But on the breastplate were 12 different precious stones. Now, when we got born again, the new birth is exactly the same for all of us. But when you come to deal with the work of a Christian or the service of a Christian, there's great variety and there's great differences. We're all blessed with different talents or gifts for various areas of service. And that, to me, is what's being brought out here in Exodus 28. You see, all of us in Jesus Christ are the same. Did you know that? Galatians chapter 3, that famous scripture in verse 28, tells us, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for all you are all one in Christ Jesus. 
He says in verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When it says baptized into Christ, it's not talking about water baptism. It's talking about spiritual birth. Friends, regeneration is the experience of all believers. Do you know, friends, as born-again people, you might have come in a different way, but friends, we're all on the same level. We're all on the same standing. Just like those two stones have the names of the tribes according to birth. Friends, whether it's King Charles or whether it's the poorest pauper in England, in the new birth, if they got saved, they only have the same standing before God. But you see, when it comes to Christian service, there is a difference, isn't there? The Bible talks about the body of Christ being made up of many members. You can't be an ear and an eye. And, you know, 12 precious stones, you see, in four rows of three as they march through the wilderness, all with different tasks, all with different abilities. You see, there was variation among the people of God. And you know, friends, there are differences of talents and gifts and the kinds of service we are given to do in the work of God. There's the variety and there's diversity in the church. God doesn't equip his people all the same. But as God gives gifts to his people, whilst he does not gift them all the same, and that's what's being brought out here in Exodus 28, but the same time as there's variety, there's unity. Because they're all set in the one breastplate, joined together as one body. Ephesians 4, you'll know the scripture, but I'll read it to you before verses 4 to 7. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. You know, I'm glad the Lord has no clothes tonight. There are differences between us all, but we're all unique. And I'm not talking about personality differences here. I'm talking about differences in our gifts and our labours for the Lord. But friends, we must work together. We must work together because we're one body. When the light of the golden candlestick, I think about this this afternoon, when the light of the golden candlestick fell on all those different stones, you know, they would all sparkle together. They all shone together in unison. And friends, we are to be in unison, radiating as a unit, and yet at the same time, individually. So what a picture in the significance of these stones. So to conclude tonight, we've looked at the symbolism of the stones, we've looked at the setting of the stones and the significance of the stones. But the most marvellous and encouraging thing about all this is the support that Christ gives to his people just as those high priestly garments supported those stones because you know there's a picture of all the Lord's people in this resting on him being supported by him and Christ just as the high priest bore up the people of God in those stones before the Lord Christ bears us before the Father at the same time and you know friends I think that was wonderful Christ supporting us, bearing us up, just like those names according to their birth were born before the, the Lord. But you know, it also struck me, those stones on the breastplate, they were close to the heart. And there's the sympathy of our high priest. 
you know, Christ supports us, and yet at the same time, he's a sympathizing Christ. And we are carried into the Holy of Holies by our great high priest. And there he prays for us. There he sends forth the Spirit to succor us. And at the same time, he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He knows all about us. And he strengthens us. And he succors us at the same time. I just pray that tonight, folks, let the Lord write these words in your heart tonight. Meditate on them. Dwell on them. And may the Lord bless it to our souls. Pray this for his glory and for his name's sake. Father, bless your word to our hearts and glorify thy name. Amen.